Well, we're very fortunate today to have uh, Professor Martin Lockley to speak to us on tracking dinosaurs and other exotic creatures in the Wild West of the USA. Um, I have known Professor Lockley for about four decades. Uh, we were colleagues at the University of Colorado Denver for many years, and in fact, the originally uh, the department was geology, geography, and physics, and so we were actually in the same department. Uh, we have grown enough that each of the departments are now somewhat separate. Anyway, um, uh, Professor Lockley's uh, uh, Vita is here, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it, this, um, and I need to read it. Uh, so Martin got his uh, BS and PhD from the United Kingdom, and his second Bachelor of Arts from the University of Colorado Denver. He's been a geology professor at the University of Colorado Denver for almost four decades, and he is the curator at the University of Colorado Museum and the Museum of Western Colorado. His main research focuses on the Mesozoic era, recent fossil footprints in Colorado, Utah, and East Asia. Publications include approximately 1,000 papers, books, book reviews, reports, and abstracts on paleontology, geology, and evolution with about 800 on fossil footprints. Books include Tracking Dinosaurs, Dinosaur Tracks, and Other uh, Fossil Footprints of the Western United States, The Eternal Trail, Fossil Footprints of the World, uh, which he was co-authored co with, and he's also involved in exhibits and site development interpretation at Dino Dinosaur Ridge, uh, Moab, Giants, CU, and elsewhere. And in terms of the CU, just within the last week or so, there is a really good dinosaur tracks exhibit in the North Classroom on the Auraria campus. If you go to the first floor, northwest corner of the building, uh, it is really impressive. Anyway, Professor Lockley. I don't know if that uh, helps. You can all hear me, can you? Can we put can we put the lights down to see this better? Perhaps I'm not sure. Okay. Well, as Clyde said, um, I came from the wild west of Wales, where I um, did uh, most of my graduate work in paleontology, and I was not interested in dinosaurs uh, when I was a kid. But I was brought up on a nature reserve. And my father was uh, actually, he was, he was a specialist in seabirds. And as you'll see uh, a little later on, I'm going to make an interesting connection between um, the carnivorous dinosaurs uh, and the extant birds of today, who are in, which are in fact their uh, descendants. Um, as Clyde sort of mentioned very briefly, I've studied fossil footprints all around the world. I don't uh, specialize or I don't focus only on dinosaur tracks, but I look at uh, bird tracks, pterosaur tracks, mammal tracks, even ancient human tracks. But considering we're here in the wild west of the USA, I'm going to focus on um, this part of the world. So I'm going to I'll give you a, a sort of general introduction to dinosaur tracking in, in the uh, USA. And then I'm going to talk about the um, rock unit that you see and go, can go and see for yourself if you haven't out at Dinosaur Ridge. How many people have been to Dinosaur Ridge? Oh, I should have asked how many people have not been to Dinosaur Ridge. Anyway, um, I, I, I want to tell you a little bit why, why Dinosaur Ridge is important because uh, you can tell a lot of the uh, aspects of the story of tracking uh, from uh, uh, just what you see at Dinosaur Ridge. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about something which we got a lot of press um, on a few years ago. And this is um, what's called nest scrape display behavior. But actually, you could sort of boil it down to a soundbite and say, if you've got dinosaurs and sex, you've got a potent combination. So um, the Wild West really is a geological paradise. If you go to places like Western Colorado, Utah, um, you see nothing but uh, spectacular rocks. This is the north end of um, this is the north end of Lake Powell, and here you see rocks from this is the Colorado River. Here you see rocks below the age of dinosaurs, uh, and then you go up through a sequence of rocks um, from the age of dinosaurs. So. 
if you're looking at the big picture of what fossil footprints tell you, you can look at um, the footprint record or what I like to call the track record from before the age of uh, dinosaurs, during the age of dinosaurs, and you see these typical, very bird-like, actually, three-toed footprints made by carnivorous dinosaurs. And the spectacular geology of um, areas like Western Colorado and Utah. And then you can look if you, which I won't talk about very much, but just to let you know, um, after the age of dinosaurs, what we call the, uh, generally speaking, the age of birds and mammals. And, uh, you know, wonderful uh, mammal uh, and bird footprints. These are a sort of 20 million year old turkey. Uh, so we have a huge database. Um, I'll mention that we just had the 30th anniversary of Dinosaur Ridge. I'll mention that again later. When I first came here, some of these rock formations, this is the one that um, stands out here, which is called the Dakota Formation, which you see at Dinosaur Ridge. There were only a couple of dinosaur track sites known in Colorado that had really been documented. Now we're looking at about 125, all the way from Kansas to, to, to Utah. So the database is huge, you know, and um, data is important for science, obviously. Um, so if we look at the, this, the, this particular rock formation, and it's, it's only representative of one rock formation, and we add up all the uh, information that we've got, we start to realize we have thousands of animals represented, not just various dinosaurs, but crocodiles, turtles, and so forth. And this is much more than you can dig up. You can't go out and dig up 2,000 dinosaurs or 2,000 pterosaurs or 2,000 mammals so easily. There are a few concentrated deposits where you get a lot of bones, but generally they're um, sparser than you might, you might think. So let's run through the age of dinosaurs in this part of the world. Um, dinosaurs appeared about 220, 230 million years ago in the Triassic uh, time period. And the Triassic was divided into three epochs or epochs. And in the late Triassic, which is famous for places like the Petrified Forest and the Painted Desert in Arizona, um, we had some of the first bipedal dinosaurs. They weren't very big. Uh, they were the size of a very large turkey or an emu or something like that. And this one, which is called Coelophysis, is actually the state fossil for New Mexico. So, um, you know, they get uh, a lot of press, dinosaurs, and you know, they're symbolic of, of this region. If you want to see um, dinosaur footprints from this time period, one of the most spectacular places you could go in, would be in Western Colorado. Ha, anybody been to Gateway, Colorado in the Dolores Valley? Yeah, um, well this is, uh, th this, is this uh, amazing palisade. Apparently it takes, I have never climbed to the top of it, but apparently it takes 16 hours to get from down here in the valley up to the top here. And it's a pretty challenging, you know, I'm talking about sort of scrambling up um, the easiest route but um, the, Chin the Chinle Formation, named after Chinle in Arizona, is um, late Triassic in age. And we have the tracks of that dinosaur, Coelophysis, or something like it. Fairly small, three-toed um, tracks. As we go up into the Jurassic, we very quickly go up from 200 million or, or, or thereabouts to 150 million. We start to get much larger fossil footprints. And you can go, uh, you can drive up into the LaSalle Mountains across into Utah uh, like you were going to Moab, which um, if any of you have done that, it's a fantastic drive. You can't really do it in the winter, but um, it's a great drive in the summer. And you find much larger dinosaur footprints. These are about 14, 15 inches long, made by large carnivorous dinosaurs. So there's the carnivorous dinosaurs and many groups of dinosaurs, the majority of them got larger uh, through evolution, which is an interesting evolutionary trend, which I don't really have time to talk about. But it might be worth reminding us that the er very early dinosaurs and most of the early representatives of different dinosaur groups were quite small. Um, continuing on into the Jurassic, some iconic scenery here. 
Um, this is Rainbow uh, Bridge, um, which used to be almost impossible to get to. Very, very few people had, had been there until Lake Powell uh, was, uh, I don't know what the word is, I was going to say created. <laughs> um, uh, and now, now you can go right, if, when the water level is high, you can just uh, drive all the way up there in your boat uh, to... Do you know the difference between an arch and a bridge? Oh, almost. Um, a, a bridge covers a water course, whether it's dry or not. An arch does not go over a, over a drainage. So it has to do with drainage. So um, anyway, so Rainbow Bridge is one of the most spectacular uh, bridges in, in uh, anywhere in uh, the world. but certainly in Western North America, and that's where it's located in relation to Navajo Mountain, and that's uh, uh, Lake Powell, as it is today. So, uh, at this time, um, just to point out, we don't just have um, dinosaurs, which always get a lot of press, but we also have um, very, some very, very small, and some of the earliest mammals or mammal ancestors and this, this, I find this one fascinating because this is a mouse-sized mammal here. These footprints are tiny. Here you can see a dime there for scale. So these are just a, a few millimeters across. And we also have, um, we, we actually have spider footprints, um, which are as large as the mammal footprint. So, and then we have, um, and uh, I actually have um, here, I can pass this around. I have a dinosaur footprint that's only about an inch or an inch and a half long. You can pass that around. And that comes from um, one of these small dinosaurs. And if you sort of multiply the length of the foot by about five, you get the hip height and multiply it again by about two and a half, you get the length of this animal. So this animal was not very big. Let's say the footprints are an inch long. So um, yes, yeah. This, so let's say that footprint I'm passing around, let's say it's an inch long. It's a little longer than that, but let's say it's an inch long, multiply by five. The hip height is five inches, multiply by two and a half, and you've got an uh, animal that's um, 12 and a half inches, a foot long, and that includes, you know, the he tail, head to tail. So these are pretty small uh, crow sized uh, dinosaurs. So. Um, and, and actually, it's interesting because in the desert, the ecology is such that most of the animals are small in the desert dunes. Well, maybe I should just go back here for a minute. This is a very famous locality, and these are fossil dunes. And you can, I, I think you have to uh, reserve, a, uh, even to hike in here these days, it's such a popular place, but you can go and see similar stuff at uh, Arches National Monument. Around Moab, yes, now it's, it's actually, well, since we're, you ask, I can go back. The Navajo Mountain here gave its name to this rock formation, which is an ancient desert. Um, and so these are ancient desert uh, sand dunes. And uh, you really see the geometry, the three-dimensional geometry of the sand dunes here. And then these are the small animals, the spiders, the, the mass-sized mammals, and the small crow-sized dinosaurs that predominate in the footprints in, in, in these deserts. Um, here's, a, here, here's a similar site um, in uh, western Colorado, and I show this because one of the things that we traditionally do is make maps of the site. So I would grid out uh, this surface uh, back in the, in the good old days of compass and tape mapping, and here in a relatively small area that you see there, we have um, a surprising number of footprints. We probably have uh, in close to 200 footprints, and we have some large ones going this way, and some, uh, and another one going this way, and then the smaller ones are all over the place. And we can even show the orientation, so we know which way, um, if there's a preferred orientation, where these animals are going. Now, one of the other things that's, that's interesting, and now I'm moving up through time fairly quickly um, to the late part of the Jurassic, and here we are out near Moab, 
And there's no doubt that the, that's a nice uh, uh, trackway. In fact, we have a replica of this trackway of all five uh, in a row here in our new exhibit um, in the North Classroom at CU Denver. And here we are with a film crew filming um, uh, some, of these, some of these tracks. Anybody recognize this guy? David Attenborough. So, um, yeah, there he is again there. So that, you know, I'm shamelessly name dropping. Um, I first uh, met David Attenborough when I was seven years old, although he didn't realize it, but he knew my dad back in the UK. And uh, so we had some st stories to tell when we, when we went on this film crew. And this was like in the 1980s. And then he came back to Dinosaur Ridge. Um, um, maybe about 10 years ago and did some filming there and I went to see him and I went up and said hello I don't know if you remember me and he said of course I remember you so you got the same t-shirt you had on 20 years ago <laughs> <laughs> he's very quick on the but anyway what's important about this surface is if you were to walk on this surf if you were to walk on this surface and see some dinosaur tracks here and keep walking around here and around here and around here and so on and go for miles actually you would find the same tracks on the same surface and this is what we call a mega track site or a dinosaur freeway and a mega track site means that the the surface with the tracks is big not that the, the tracks themselves are particularly big they can be any size we call it a dinosaur freeway because the same surface has tracks on it over huge areas and this is actually a puzzle for geologists and um, you know there are some explanations but just to give you an idea um, when when I first made this map uh, back in the eight in the late 80s and early 90s this is the area that I just showed you this is the west flank of the Salt Valley anticline and um, here's the scale here so the whole distance is over 10 kilometers six seven miles and uh, you can go from you know, you can go a kilometer or half a kilometer from one place to another, and there are tracks all along here. We have 26 different track sites in this area, but in fact, it covers this whole area back to the Colorado state line, and, it, and we've traced it now out towards Green River, which is over here somewhere, and all the way down towards uh, Escalante and um, Lake Powell. So actually, this surface, um, this surface, this megatraxite surface, covers at least 350 kilometers. If you want to, you know, convert it into miles, it's a couple of hundred miles uh, uh, across uh, central, south central Utah. And what, what, it, what this represents is that there was a shoreline here uh, of a sea that came in from the north. And as the shoreline sort of moved, um, these tracks weren't all made at the same time, over 200 um, miles. But as the shoreline moved, it created a single layer. And uh, we call that, as scientists might, diachronous or time transgressive. But um, it's still a very narrow um, slice of geological time. So um, we have just above that layer, we have something similar going on where this seaway came in to here. Here's, uh, here's Colorado and Utah, uh, New Mexico, Arizona. The seaway came in here and all across this, uh, this area from Arizona, Colorado, o Oklahoma, Utah, Wyoming, we have pterosaur footprints. And so it turns out the pterosaurs like to uh, like the shores of, sh of seas and um, if, if the water is shallow enough along the, these marine embayments, um, they would, you, you would get a lot of tracks preserved. So we have tracks at, uh, the, you know, 17 or 18 localities uh, here, all across this area. And nobody knew what pterosaur tracks looked like until the 1990s. In fact, there was a huge debate about it. And uh, some people didn't believe that uh, th these tracks were, in fact, here's, here's one from Cactus Park in Colorado. Um, we have them in Colorado in Western Colorado and we have them in extreme south East Colorado down in Backer County near the Oklahoma Panhandle. A lot of people didn't believe these were pterosaur tracks because they thought pterosaur tracks walked on their hind legs. 
Um, but they actually flop down and their wing, uh, their wing fingers, um, well not their wing fingers, but uh, their wrists here, they have little, you can't see it very well here, they have um, small fingers. This is the fourth finger of the, I'm not making a rude gesture, that's the fourth <laughs> finger, is the long one. And then they have the other three fingers actually flop down on the ground. But anyway, so um, the point is, is that we study, we're not, we don't discriminate between dinosaurs and pterosaurs and crocodiles. We'll study anything that's willing to leave its, leave its tracks. Now, uh, most, uh, possibly the track site that got me involved um, more than anything in studying fo footprints when I first came here in the early 1980s was this one here, which is in southeast Colorado. Uh, it's in the Morrison Formation, which is again late Jurassic. And it's a huge, uh, huge uh, uh, track site which represents activity along the shores of a lake. We actually call it uh, Dinosaur Lake. It's in the Picatoire or Purgatoire Valley. And they run tours down there if you want to go there. Uh, you can contact the Forest Service in La Junta and they'll take you down there. And um, this site is so big, it's been ranked number five uh, on various criteria in the, uh, uh, of the top 10 track sites in, in the USA. And it's also appeared on world global rankings uh, fairly high. So uh, one of the things that we do is, you know, we can't cut out these huge tracks of um, these sauropod or brontosaur dinosaurs. So we make, we make replicas. Uh, this is a fiberglass replica. You can see a lot of replicas in our exhibit. This one's actually about to be shipped off. That's a FedEx plane. It's about to go to Switzerland, actually, for a uh, exhibit. Now, um, so that's the end of the Jurassic. The Jurassic ended about 145 million years ago. I'm now going to talk um, about the Cretaceous, and I'm going to be focusing, as I said, on this um, unit that is very, very rich in tracks, which is the same unit that um, you can see at Dinosaur Ridge. It's called the Dakota Sandstone. Some people have called it, uh, you could call it uh, the tracks at Dinosaur Ridge, although only on the east side because the west side is, is Jurassic where the dinosaur bones come from. And uh, so, um, as I said, the Dakota Sandstone. It turns out we only found out quite recently that Arthur Lakes, who was a professor at the um, School of Mines when the School of Mines first started back in the 1870s, had actually found um, these, uh, the first dinosaur footprints ever found in Colorado back in 1902. And um, they, they, they were in the flower bed, if you, can, if you can imagine this, at Colorado College in Colorado Springs. And one of my friends told me when I first got here, we've got dinosaur tracks in the, you know, outside uh, our building uh, in the, Open in the campus in the flower bed, and so I said, "Well, I think I know which rock formation they come from, but I had no idea where they came from." And we thought they had never been described. It turns out that um, one of our University of Colorado Denver um, uh, librarians found this uh, uh, 1902 article in the uh, one of the Colorado newspapers, and this is the only documentation of the first dinosaur tracks to come from, uh, to be found anywhere in Colorado. And they're in the same layer as, as Dinosaur Ridge. This is, this is Dinosaur Ridge today, more or less. But in the 1930s, when they put this road, Alameda, uh, over to connect up to, the, um, to Red Rocks, um, they, they found all these dinosaur tracks. And this is a historic photo of um, the some of the first dinosaur tracks uh, found on Dinosaur Ridge and photographed. And uh, this is the I-70 road cut. This is the Jurassic part. And there are a few tracks and a few bones have come from this area. I'm not here to talk about Jurassic bones. And then that's the Cretaceous part. So we're going up through time here. And uh, Dinosaur Ridge now d ranks number one in the US um, that's one of the most important 
dinosaur track sites uh, anywhere, but certainly, you know, top ranked in the USA. And I need to tell you why and how that ranking is done. So we'll, we'll, I'll sort of fill that in as we go along. When we first started ma mapping there, and I should say that when I first came here, the first thing one of my geological colleagues says, says we must take you out to the hogback. It wasn't called Dinosaur Ridge in the 18, uh, 1980s. We must take you out to the hogback because it's got fantastic geology, uh, lovely ripple marks, and then we can go up to Red Rocks, which is, of course, world famous. Um, and really, the dinosaur tracks hadn't been studied. We knew there were some dinosaur tracks, and oh, by the way, there's a dinosaur track up there. So when we first um, worked on this site, we mapped this area and it showed about 150 dinosaur tracks, maybe representing about 15 animals. And there seemed to be an indication of three animals here going in the same direction. So we did a little reconstruction. They said, oh, you know, maybe they were friendly and going along together in a group. Um, but what happened then is we decided in the early 1990s to excavate here and believe me you can't do this without a permit don't go out and with dynamite to dinosaur ridge but uh, we we excavated a, a, a huge area here so you can see we're actually doing it in the winter here's one of my uh, one of my colleagues who worked with me at CU for some CU Denver for some years and basically what we did is we added this area in here and not only that but there was another layer above it that these tracks were, were impressions, which we call natural molds or impressions. But um, uh, uh, when we removed this layer, there was a layer of, if you can uh, see this, there was a layer of shale here. And in the shale, the impressions were filled by a sandstone. And we got these, these negatives or natural casts. Some people call them innies and outies, which doesn't sound very scientific, but you can can call the molds a natural cast. So this is a natural cast. What, the one I passed around is a natural mold, but you could reverse it. And this is kind of like um, really the, the replica of the foot. <coughs> and uh, if anybody has trouble visualizing it, I just say, imagine that you're lying on the beach, you know, having a time traveling dream and you wake up and there's a dinosaur just about to step on your face. Uh, and you would see essentially the foot, uh, the underside of the foot, and that's, this is what this is. This is really a replica of the foot where the track has been filled in. But because we have more information here, all of a sudden our group of three now becomes a group of six, and we've got these six animals moving um, like this. So um, if you enlarge a track site or restudy it or whatever, you're, you're going to get more, more information. And for our 21st anniversary, um, we uh, had a very famous artist who did a limited edition print uh, of, uh, of dinosaur, uh, of the tracks of Dinosaur Ridge. And I like to do, um, I've got a copy of this with me. Uh, paleontologists, it's sort of an occupational hazard that we're, we're reconstructing scenes from the past and animals from the past from small bits of, you know, the jigsaw puzzle. And so there's a lot of uh, reconstruction that goes on. And some of it's pretty sophisticated. It's pretty accurate. And nowadays, when we get complete dinosaurs with feather impressions and so forth, our reconstructions can be pretty accurate. Unfortunately, we don't have complete feathered dinosaurs from, from Colorado, or, or um, most of those are coming out of, out of China. So, but we have another dinosaur freeway story here. And, um, uh, this is, uh, you can go all the way from, um, you know, uh, Colorado east into Utah, uh, sorry, west into Utah, or southeast into Kansas and Oklahoma. And this is what the, um, st uh, the, st the stratigraphy looks like, you know, this is New Mexico, Colorado. And this, uh, we have these very extensive dinosaur uh, freeways. It's a very, very large, it's a very, very large area. And so, we first realized this studying the stuff at um, Dinosaur Ridge, and we found in the same layers going up north as far as Boulder and south down to Roxburgh, um, dinosaur tracks in the same layers. And then we 
extended that, as I said, all the way across Colorado and into neighboring states. So there are, there are geological interpretations which I've mentioned, which I think are the important ones, and that is that Denver was beachfront property at the time. This is the Western Interior Seaway, or the Western Interior Cretaceous Seaway, as geologists call it. And so the coastline was here, and as the coastline moved slowly, these layers of rock were laid down with the dinosaur tracks in them. And you probably can't see the details here, but, well, maybe you can. But um, this particular unit has been very precisely dated using um, a number of uh, methods which uh, I don't know about in great detail, but there's fission track dating from zircons, and there's uranium lead uh, um, radiometric dating and so forth. And we've dated stuff, um, the track bearing layers, to just under about 100 million years. We've got a lot of dates from about 97, 98 million years. So there's a lot known. A, a kind of interesting thing is that the, today we still have this Im important geological feature, the Front Range and the Rocky Mountains, going all the way parallel to um, the ancient uh, um, axis of the seaway. And today it's a, it's, it's a migration route. And uh, when we first discovered this, um, uh, that we had a dinosaur, what we call a dinosaur freeway here. Besides the geological interpretation, a lot of people said, oh, this must have been a migration route because the same animals were going for, uh, for thousands or hundreds of miles. Now, we've got to be careful here. When we say the same animals, we mean the same species of animal. We don't mean the same individuals. We haven't yet found a dinosaur with a bent toe that appeared in New Mexico and Colorado and Utah. It is theoretically possible, but I'll leave it to the astronomers to come up with a probability for that. Um, but anyway, uh, so it's definitely possible that this was a migration route, but we can't prove it. So we always have to look at both the geological and the uh, biological or paleobiological paleo interpretations. We continue to find stuff at Dinosaur Ridge. One of our most recent uh, discoveries, and this always gets uh, um, some people excited, were what we call raptor tracks. I'm actually wearing my raptor t-shirt, and don't know if you can see it says Velociraptor. Um, but this is, oops, this is what, um, this is what the foot of a Velociraptor um, and its relatives look like. And we have found in Utah this very clear uh, two-toed track. For a long time, there were no two-toed tracks known. We said they should have two-toed tracks because the raptors are known for having this retracted um, claw. Um, if you count your, your fingers, one would be your thumb, two, three, four, five. You can do the same on your toes with your big toe being one. The, Theropod dinosaur foot is essentially uh, mostly, oops, wrong button, mostly two, three, and four, and two is recurved like a cat's claw, or the cats re um, retract all of their claws. So we expected to find this, and eventually we did. The first one was found in China. This was the first decent trackway anywhere in the USA, and now we have one at Dinosaur Ridge. Uh, maybe you can't see it so clearly there, but this is a, a reconstruction that uh, the two toes there. Um, it's the same age as the one at Utah. Now, birds. It's now conventional wisdom to say the dinosaurs are not extinct. So if you're looking at, you know, finches or um, whatever in your back garden, you're looking at living dinosaurs. Interestingly enough, the very first true bird tracks, and they were then just called bird tracks, not dinosaur tracks, found anywhere in the Mesozoic were found in Golden. And they were, uh, there are many stories attached to this which I don't have time for, but this is what they look like. Uh, and they're very similar to the tracks of a small night heron. And um, these were considered very important at the time, and they were published in a major journal, the American Journal of Science. And um, we still call them birds, but uh, a lot of paleontologists want to say avian dinosaurs 
it's another way of saying birds, are non-avian dinosaurs. So take your pick. I'm happy to, um, you know, to call them to call them birds. But again, as I said, when I write papers, I have to say non or avian avian dinosaurs. So they are still very rare, these avian dinosaurs or bird tracks uh, at this time period. It took me 25 years to find another site along the Front Range, and that was down at Roxburgh. And we still only have um, three sites out of 125 in this particular rock unit that have bird tracks. So anyway, I'll show you another picture of uh, them. This is, uh, again, what they look like. Very well preserved. You can actually probably see they have a little hallux sticking back, which is kind of typical of herons. It's really surprising because we don't have any bones of birds that look anything like uh, small herons, but the tracks are almost identical. This has been a puzzle. We have bird tracks that are undistinguishable from modern tracks, but we don't have the, um, the bird skeletons to fit them. It's what I call the Cinderella syndrome. Um, also, the first crocodile tracks ever found from the Mesozoic were also found um, in uh, uh, right here along the Front Range. This is a part of the northern part of Dinosaur Ridge, just going into Golden. And this is what I call the psychedelic version. And now, um, in the last uh, five, ten years particularly, we're starting to do 3D imaging of um, uh, the tracks. And, well, for one thing, it makes um, it makes the track images visually very attractive. I, I, I hope you can see what you're looking at here. We have these three three toes here, and a couple here, a couple here, three more here. A lot of, there's a three toe set. We get this repeat pattern: three, 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 three. So we have dozens of crocodiles that were going in this direction, and they were digging just their toes in. So they were probably swimming. And why were they all going in the same direction? Well. Possibly there was just a channel and they had to go in that direction, or there was a flood and they were, you know, um, being driven by, by water currents. But this is very common with swim tracks to have a strong direction. Here's a very big one here, by the way. And, you know, if you're into, you know, these National Geographic, you know, crocodile hunting, you know, Steve Irwin type things, this was a pretty big crocodile. It was probably uh, 13, 14, 15 feet long. And we think that they may have been the major predators at this time and were ambushing uh, dinosaurs along the, along the dinosaur freeway. So um, I'm now going to just flip over to the uh, other side of um, the continental divide um, where we have what you would call the dinosaur, what's now called the dinosaur diamond. It used to be the dinosaur triangle. Um, how many people have been to look at dinosaurs or just scenery at um, Moab or Grand Junction? I'm sure many of you have. Uh, it used to be the Dinosaur Triangle, um, and there are dinosaur museums at all of these places, and there's a new one which I'm involved in called Moab Giants, which is just north of, uh, north of Moab. And so this is a, another historic dinosaur area um, like the Front Range, like Dinosaur Ridge. And we had um, the good fortune to find this. And not just this, that's this one. There's another one here, there's another one here. There's a whole series of um, what appear to be pairs of scrape marks with a ridge in the middle. Here's the um, 3D relief in glorious, you know, technicolor. I was going to say psychedelic technicolor. And, you know, the, the, it's quite deep here, and it's, there's a ridge in the middle uh, here. And um, if you really uh, play around with the imaging, you can actually come up with what appears to be a dinosaur track here. And we know that there are these uh, carnivorous dinosaur scrapes. The, these uh, scratch marks are very sharp and like they were made by claws. And... Um, we have actual dinosaur tracks. We have a couple where you see a dinosaur track right here, and, and then it sort of goes into a scrape. 
And this whole area which we walked over just thinking there were potholes in this dry wash, turns out that these are all uh, scrape marks. So this particular site, which is maybe a mile away from this one, has about 12 or 13 scrapes. This one has something like 50. Now what were these animals doing? They're the ancestors of birds and we came to the conclusion that this is what's called nest scrape display behavior. So these animals um, are obviously, they're fairly big. You, saw the si you can see the size of these things. I mean, this is the size of a bathtub. They're fairly big, so they didn't fly. Uh, so they would have nested on the ground. And we know dinosaurs laid eggs. We know what dinosaur nesting sites look like. But these can't possibly be nests, because if you sit down and lay eggs in this, you're going to smudge this out, and it's going to take months for the eggs to incubate and the animals to hatch and so forth. So um, the fact that you've got so many of them is a clue, because what birds do today, and these their ancestors were doing 100 million years ago, was the males were showing off to the females. I know how to build a nest. And noth nothing's changed, right? Males showing off to the, the girlfriends, saying, I know how to build a nest. What do you think of that? And, oh, I don't, you know, it's not, I'm not impressed. So I'll do another one. Do so they would do dozens of these things, far more than they need to. Some birds build multiple nests before they pair off and breed. But anyway, so this is what the, the ornithologists, and I'll tell you in a minute, my dad was one, they know all about this. They know all about nest scrape display behavior. And um, suddenly, for the first time, and it is the first time, we have the physical evidence in the substrate, a hundred million year old substrate, of this activity. And we have the same thing at Dinosaur Ridge. And here's the 3D image of Dinosaur Ridge. And I think you can see very nicely the ridge down the middle, the long scrape marks. This, these are almost six feet long. I can tell you, I made a, I made a rubber mold of this and a, you know, a fiberglass replica. It's the size of a door. You know, it's, uh, it, it, they're big. And so this is, uh, you know, they have these two, two left and a right scrape, and then you have a ridge in the middle. Nest scrape display behavior. Well, uh, we know that modern birds do a lot of uh, courtship activity. And here's what I think is interesting. Um, now I'm going to indulge myself just a little bit and tell you that um, my father was a um, ornithologist, and w when he w um, with his first wife, he lived on this island called Skokum. Here's the island of Skokum. It's a very, very famous bird observatory these days, and the whole coast of Wales is uh, is um, very important. Um, nature reserve, it's a national park, the coastal national park. And my father studied puffins. Here's the island that he worked on. I'm showing off shamelessly, but I'm proud of my dad, so what's wrong with that? And here's a book that he wrote about life on this island. Before the war, now you say, you're not that old. This was, he lived with his first wife um, in the 1930s and studied these birds. And um, he wrote a book on puffins. Here it is again. I'm very proud of this one because this is the book that he dedicated to me when I was three years old. And not in this book, but in this book, another book on puffins, a more recent book, it says a compelling parallel with the Cretaceous grapes from Colorado was reported for the Atlantic puffin uh, in the run-up to breeding, which thanks to repeated scratching and kicking, produces two parallel furrows on the floor of the burrow with a characteristic ridge in between that becomes worn down and less obvious during the breeding season. So here, I mean, it would have been, uh, it would have been even better, you know, just uh, for people who like coincidences or, you know, if my father had written this, but it was written in the other more recent Puffin book, but here's the thing that I find um, fascinating. What's the next one here? Um, so if you look at the literature on dinosaur courtship behavior before we published this in 2016, there's a huge amount of literature about 
dinosaur sexual display activity. And it's all speculation, although it's <coughs> intelligent speculation, the attitude was, well, birds are uh, the descendants of dinosaurs. Birds do this elaborate display. They have feathers, they have crests and so forth. Therefore, dinosaurs did it and did the same thing. And you could find dozens of papers in the literature and I use the word speculation or conjecture, saying that this is, um, that the theropod dinosaurs were engaging the same behavior as modern birds, but there was no physical evidence. And the, on the other side of the coin is, because I know ornithologists, you know, um, my dad was one. When the ornithologist is watching the bird, birds in the sexual behavior they say, well, he put his left wing up six times, he put his right wing up seven times, he jumped up and down, swirled his head around three times, scratched on the ground, and then he flew off. Close the book, go home. Never look at the scratch marks. You can go on YouTube and see these birds scratching, but can you find a, can you find a, a, a scientific paper that describes the scratch marks in the ground? They're considered insignificant. So here we make the physical connection from the 100 million years ago with the behavior that we see in modern birds uh, today. So um, anyway, so birds go crazy in the mating season. Uh, we know what nest sites look like of modern birds and dinosaur nest sites look the same. And um, they get very emotional. And um, so we have finally published this, this paper in a journal, uh, quite, quite a decent journal called Scientific Reports. And, the title was Theropod Courtship, Large Scale Physical Evidence of Display Arenas and Avian Like Scrape Ceremony Behavior by Cretaceous Dinosaurs. And um, again, I feel a little embarrassed because I'm showing off uh, terribly, but we knew that this combination of dinosaurs and sex was going to catch the uh, attention of the media. So we put out a press release, we did it. Uh, in January, in, in um, 2016 in January, out at Dinosaur Ridge because we had some examples there and it went viral. But to cut a long story short, we got on the late night uh, television programs, we got in the satirical magazine The Onion. So now I can, <laughs> I can die happy, you know. <laughs> I've made it <laughs> in the world of pub in, in, uh, publishing. We found new uh, um, site since then in, in western Colorado. Uh, this is uh, a, a pair of scrapes here that is actually in the exhibit that we've just done at Dinosaur Ridge and it comes from, it comes from Colorado actually from, from, from Grand Junction. And um, uh, we now have three sites, I've shown you, I've shown you this one, uh, we now have three major sites in of, of this great uh, uh, display behavior in Western Colorado. And um, they're at sites that are up to six or seven kilometers apart. And again, they're not almost, we think, at the same level. But there's one other thing that we need to say here. Um, these, the, uh, imagine you're a dinosaur and it's the breeding season and you're getting excited and you've, you've got a mate or you, see somebody you like and and you, you start doing this this great behavior and you impress you know the your partner and you say right well I'm tired after doing all this scrapes let's go make a nest you're not going to wander off a hundred kilometers you're going to nest fairly near there's absolutely no evidence of nest sites in this rock formation remember I said there's 123 dinosaur footprint sites or 125 dinosaur footprint sites from Utah to Colorado not one evidence of a nest site, but this is telling us that they must have nested nearby and they must have nested in these same layers, but the, the nests are just not preserved for whatever reason. And this is a salutary reminder that 90% of what we see in, uh, or most of what we see in the fossil record is a very small proportion and 90% of it or more is gone um, due to you know, just being eroded away or not having not yet been discovered or... Yeah, Becky. Mark, how did you rule out um, just aggression as, as behavior? I mean, you're making 
a compelling case for the sexual display, but um, well, that's a good question. We um, we looked at all of the animals that do scrapes, and including mammals, and you know, cats do uh, scrapes and mark their territory. But most cats, um, like bobcats or mountain lions, they'll sc they'll do one little scrape up on a path in the mountains in a place that has very very low preservation potential. All of this is preserved because it's very near sea level and was covered over by another flood. But what's interesting is um, this kind of, you know, chickens scratch. And a lot of people said, well, they're chickens. They're scratching for seeds, you know. Well, no, these are large carnivorous dinosaurs. They're not digging out roots. They're not digging for water. If you dug for water and um, you and the water ponded up here, you'd get a bathtub rim and all of the scratch marks would be, be washed out. So we made a whole list of possible things and sort of eliminated them one by one. But uh, your question is very good because is there a, I could get into sociology right here, is there a connection between sexual behavior and aggressive behavior? Just watch the, no, I mean, it, any animal, just watch the nightly news, come on. Um, so, it, it, the thing is that they only have two feet, and they can scratch for a number of different reasons. And birds do a lot of stereotype behavior. There's a lot of very interesting literature from early in the 20th century about this, when people were first looking at this. And um, birds will, uh, one of the stereotype behaviors that birds will do is they will pick up um, nesting material and fly around and say, what am I doing? It's not the breeding season. I'm not building a nest. What am I doing with this? And then they'll drop it. So um, I think that this nest scrape behavior, nest scrape display behavior is, could actually be a, a more, how could we say, a more organized or constrained or hormone controlled or seasonal um, focused behavior that at other times might be a species of aggressive behavior. So uh, if, a, if a male dinosaur sees another male dinosaur out of the breeding season, it might do a couple of scrapes like, and, and it's interesting because some mammals do it. But so I don't know if that answers your question, but what I can say is that this is the first evidence that this behavior, this sexual display behavior, which nobody's, nobody's told us we're wrong. Some people have, like you have said, you know, are there other possibilities that you considered? Um, if it is what we think it is, sexual display behavior, it was a hundred million years ago just like feathers on dinosaurs were a uh, hundred million years ago, uh, just like other bird behaviors um, or bird comparisons were go back a hundred million years. So where do we go from here? Um, yeah, this is just to show that these th this, th this these distributions here and here um, are not the regular distributions that you see in nesting colonies of birds or, or dinosaurs. So, um, as I said, we have four sites now, uh, three site, big sites in Western Colorado, another small one, a site at Dinosaur Ridge. We have fi five sites. And this was the um, artistic rendition that we put together. These, I think these, artis these artistic renditions always have too many trees too close to the big flat areas of, um, of mud where, where we find the tracks. But that's just artistic, artistic license. And um, we, you know, we looked at the, you know, we looked at the size of these things. And uh, we have both small and large dinosaurs in some of these sites. Which is interesting because very often, in if you go to um, bird reserves, you'll very often see one species of large seabirds nesting very close to another species of small, much smaller seabirds. So, anyway, you don't need to see all of this data. We have one site from Korea, which appears to be um, a very, very small set of scrapes. We don't really know what this is, 
But it fit, if you see these, uh, if you separate out the, these scrapes, it very clearly looks like two, a, a left and a right three-toed footprint. And this is a, a dinosaur. I, I haven't put a picture of it in other than these. This is a dinosaur that the smallest footprint is one centimeter long. These footprints are about two and a half centimeters long, about an inch long. This animal was the size of a sparrow. And a lot of the scratch making dinosaurs today are little plovers and uh, very small, small dinosaurs. In fact, that's one of the things about birds in general is they're small, the theropod dinosaurs. And we have bird tracks from the same uh, deposit here and they're basically larger than these uh, very, very small dinosaurs. So it's fascinating that we even have this stuff, we ha even have this stuff preserved. Um, I say you can't find literature where they describe these things closely, but you can go on YouTube and you know, maybe, maybe something's come out recently. And we've been thinking about going out in the breeding season and seeing plovers right here in Colorado and trying to find where they make scratch marks. But they have to make scratch marks in surfaces that we can go and pour the plaster in and get the, get the um, you know, uh, shape, the three-dimensional shape of these. Or even we can photograph them and do 3D uh, modeling. So um, there's one site, in, in, uh, one site with one set of scrape marks from British Columbia, same age as the stuff from Colorado. So as I said, the next steps are to continue in all of these areas. So finally, I just say, CU Denver, you know, I'm uh, boasting about CU Denver's dinosaur or track research. It's one of the main centers of uh, research activity in fossil footprints. There's a lot going on in the St. George area. And actually, I'm really referring here to collections. We have over 3,000 fossil footprints in the CU collections. You can actually go online and see them all. Uh, um, we got a grant to uh, put it all online. And uh, then we, uh, I'm retired now. We used to be based in, um, we are, my office is still in uh, St. Cadetans on the Auraria campus. We used to have a dinosaur tracks museum there. It was actually there for 16 years. Well kept secret, um, perhaps, but um, there are many places you can see dinosaur tracks. There's a lot of activity being going on on the western slope. This is a new site near Moab. There's a dinosaur museum in Blanding. There's new Moab Giants now being opened three years. We have a dinosaur trail with 125 dinosaurs. You can walk around this trail, it's just north of Moab. And then finally, the epilogue. It's interesting that Clyde invited me to do this um, a couple of months ago because we just yesterday finished installing this exhibit uh, in the North Classroom, as Clyde mentioned, and you can all go and see it for free at any time now. And um, it was hard on the heels of uh, the 30th anniversary of, of, of Dinosaur Ridge, which was just celebrated um, a, a couple of weeks ago. So thanks to Clyde and thanks to the Secular Hub for invitation. Yes, sir, I see a hand going up. I'm happy to take questions. You said uh, you, you, you haven't found the nests, but you know, the scrapes from this, this Sorry, you said you found the uh, the scrapes from this nesting-like behavior, but not the nests. I'm wondering to get the preserved tracks and scrapes, you need the certain type of coastal mudflat, right? More or less, yes. I'm wondering if that's not a good place to build a nest. Then maybe you're getting this scrape behavior preserved but they're building the nest maybe a little higher ground in a place that's not being preserved. Yeah. One of the things that's very interesting, um, I'll try and answer your question because there are, there are a lot of unknowns, but uh, one of the things very interesting about this particular formation, the Dakota sandstone it's called, um, is that 
We have lots and lots and lots of tracks. We also have lots and lots and lots of plant fossils, but we have no bones, no eggs or eggshells. And it's fairly well known to geologists that this type of environment, rather like a coal swamp or a peat bog, um, these coastal plain environments are very acidic. So we don't even find clamshells. You know, they occasionally we'll find a, an impression or a mold of this stuff. So um, it's quite possible that if, if nests had been um, uh, dug as shallow, shallow pits, and uh, they'd used rotting vegetation, which some large birds do, uh, to, to cover the nest. Or even if they didn't use it, if they, if they left eggshells and even dead babies, which would have tiny little bones like toothpicks, they're just dissolved away. So there could be nests out there, but we just don't recognize them. But there are, th there are half a dozen really important nest sites all around the world, some in Mongolia, very famous China, some in Argentina, a few in the south of France. But considering that there are hundreds of dinosaur species that lived right throughout the age of dinosaurs and that they all had to have um, nested, and we only have maybe a dozen nest sites scattered around the world, it just shows how little you know, is preserved as a proportion of what uh, once existed. I don't know if that helps answer the question a little bit. Well, I'm just saying maybe the nests aren't in the, the places where fossils are formed. They're, they're different environments. Yeah, but as I said, we know from if 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 we know that um, birds and dino and the theropod dinosaurs had similar um, nest scrape display or courtship behavior, and that birds, when they do their courtship, they don't then find a mate and say, let's wander off or even fly off a long way. They nest very near where they do the scrape behavior because that, it's a territorial thing. So you could say that this must be nest site territory. I wouldn't say I could guarantee it's nest site territory, but that's the parsimonious assumption or you know interpretation. Now, I don't want to sound like Donald Rumsfeld, but there are things that we know that we know and things that we know that we don't know, et cetera, et cetera, particularly in paleontology. The North Classroom is between, um, uh, just south of Spear, between Lawrence and Larimer. The only difficult thing, uh, you know, uh, depends on what time of day or what time of year you go, is just to find somewhere to park, unless you go, but you can take the light rail down there. Yeah, the address is 1200 Larimer Street, and this week is, the coming week is finals week. So if you wait one week, the parking will be a lot easier because it's too <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, or, if, or Friday or the weekend. And they, they do lock the building later uh, in the evenings on weekends and Sundays, but... So is there a name in the building? Just ask anybody for the North Classroom. It, it, it's, uh, as I said, if you're on spear between... Um, Larimer and Lawrence, you're looking right at it. It's a fairly big building. I think it's actually a big building on campus. Yeah. So it's right at the corner of the street. It has. The first it is, uh, yeah, it's right. It's it's right. I guess you would call it the south west corner or the south corner. Northwest. No. Oh yeah. No. Yeah. Northwest. Sorry. Northwest corner of the building. Yeah. And there's campus maps all around the oh, campus okay. as well. Yeah, and you could just, on MapQuest, you could probably put in North Classroom, Herrera Campus, and you'd find it. Are you still doing work down at Picket Wire? Um, yes and no. Um, the, uh, there's talk about doing a new guidebook. Um, I work very closely with the Forest Service guy, Bruce Schumacher. I don't know if you know him, but um, he, they did a huge excavation on the north side of the river and they've uncovered 
um, well, let me go. Let me back up just a little bit. When we did the initial survey, we had something like 1,300 footprints representing 100 or more animals. And when was that? And, and was that? Well, that was in the that was in the 1980s. But at that time, we had um, cleared off the surface completely at different times. And then it would flood, and we'd have to clear off the mud again. But we cleared off the south bank almost completely um, at different times. And we mapped it for about 350 meters, um, almost a quarter of a mile. But um, at that time, it wasn't owned by the Forest Service. Then the Forest Service took it over. <coughs> And they began to manage it. And one of the Forest Service pa paleontologists, um, in fairly recent years, they did a huge excavation on the north side. So we still have to publish that in some some detail. So the work is ongoing. But I'm kind of like a second string player now because the Forest Service uh, has sort of taken over that that project. Yeah, I've been there several times, and it seems like there's a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious on the latest, where they're at with that. Does I, I, that floods it out and it covers it back up? Yeah, I, I, you know, the first time we went down there, um, you know, I, I mean, I was literally fresh off the boat, you know, and I went down there in the in the fall and I, uh, you know, and the, the, I say, I'm interested to see this purgatory river, you know, and it was just a little trickle, you know, and you could walk across without h hardly getting your feet wet. And we worked on it all winter. Oh, wow, you know, ama amazing track site. We got 100 tracks mapped, 200, 300, and we cleared off all this stuff. And then we went back in the spring, and it was this, you know, it was like three feet deep in, in, of muddy water in the spring runoff. And uh, all, everything we cleaned off was sort of dumped back on there. And then so it became a seasonal project for us. And we used to camp down there. I, I made a joke that um, I think we probably camped down there like 20 weekends over, I don't know, three, four years to finish the project. So we spent 40 days and 40 nights in purgatory. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's called it's interesting because the Spanish called it Rio de las Animas Perdidas, the River of Lost Souls. The French called it Purgatoire with the French pronunciation. And then the, uh, I don't know, I suppose the Anglo settlers, you would say, they, they heard people say Purgatoire and they called it, they knew it meant purgatory, but they either called it purgatory or they called it picket wire which was the corruption of the French pronunciation. And so they call it Picket Wire or Purgatory Canyon now. And it's managed by the, the Forest Service. It's part of the Comanche National Grasslands, which is USDA Forest Service. And you can book a, a tour down there. Or if you want, it's, a, it's five and a half mile. If you don't go on a tour, which you have to go through a lock gate and cross another property, which the Forest Service have permission to do uh, and drive right in there. If you want to take a mountain bike or walk or take a horse, there's a five and a half mile um, one way where you drop down into the canyon at a different location and can, and can uh, ride or bike or walk in there. But I warn you, if you go down there in the summer and you want to walk in, you know, it can be 110 degrees. <laughs> I was wondering, um, did you s say that the um, spider tracks were from that area? Uh, no, the spider tracks are from that, like Navajo, sandstone out in Utah. Uh, the, mostly the Navajo formation, rock formation, is mostly found in Utah, places like Arches, Lake Powell, Rainbow Bridge area. Because I know when I was down at the um, that, uh, track site, um, and I was camping there. Uh, there was people there not to see the dinosaur tracks, but to see the oh, yeah, yeah, tarantula yeah. migrations. Yeah, which happen a lot. October, or, October. You know, yeah, it's yeah. a great time. Right. Um, and you know, what, when I was there, there was only a few around. But people had said the previous year there was hundreds of them, 
and they even have tarantula crossing signs on yeah. some of the roads. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just a word of warning, if you hike in, make sure you have good solid shoes because the trail is well. a lot of goat's head, um, Cactus. Uh, the uh, thorns. And I rode my mountain bike in there and had flat tire <laughs> by yeah. the time I got back. Uh, it's kind of like what they call a Sonora ecosystem down there. So there's a lot of chaya cactus. You, if you're lucky, you'll see roadrunners as well. On your mountain bike, is that mountain bike? There's a special cylinder called Stance. Well, I had I had slime oh, okay. and okay. thornproof tubes, oh, okay. <laughs> so I I did have uh, air most of the way. <laughs> I might say something else if you go down there. If you're interested in history, um, before the the Great Dust Bowl, uh, they had um, a couple of relatively wet decades, I guess. And there's a lot, there's an old church, a graveyard down there, and there's a lot of old, uh, um, what did they call it when they gave the quarter section to people, homestead. homestead. There are a lot of old homesteads. I know a guy who uh, has a, a leased a, a 50,000 acre ranch in the Oklahoma Panhandle, which is just very near there. And he said, you know, there's at least 50 homesteads on this ranch, you know. So it's changed, and you can also you can also see um, in some places down there as you go around La Hunter and South, you can see the old sand dunes from the Dust Bowl, but they've been you know partially grown over. You don't see any; those big sand dunes were like 50, 50 feet high. You don't see any fifty foot sand dunes anymore, but you know you see some smaller ones that are grown over. Did you have another? Yeah, question? you mentioned uh, feathered dinosaurs a number of times. Is it beginning to seem like most dinosaurs probably had feathers, and all these artist renditions of them with this, you know, rough skin is probably not realistic? Um, that's a good question. I think that um, I think that most mostly it's the carnivorous small carnivorous dinosaurs that are the ancestors of birds that uh, uh, that have um, feathers and of course they found a lot of feathered birds um, with you know in the same deposits so they make the distinction you know this is, I found a bird or an avian dinosaur and a non-avian dinosaur um, there is there there are some um, non another group of dinosaurs that are not the uh, a bird ancestors that have s have some unusual filaments on them, but they don't appear to be as strongly feathered. And then we do have some of the really big dinosaurs, like the Triceratops or the sauropods, uh, stegosaurs, and so forth. There's no sign of feathers on them, and uh, some of them have very big, sort of armored scutes like crocodiles. So I don't think they had feathers. But I sometimes tell people I'm not really an expert on dinosaurs. You know, maybe their feet, <laughs> and they're, certainly their tracks. <laughs> and, the, and the skin, I didn't mention this, but I could show you on my phone, I didn't. But I have, um, we just described some uh, tracks one centimeter, I mean one inch long from Korea with just beautiful, beautiful, very, very fine skin impressions, texture. I could show you on my on my phone, but I didn't I didn't Korea's a whole <laughs> another lecture, Korean tracks. And that was on the news, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, we that was a fairly re that came out in January or something and we, we did put out a press release on that, but I might just add, um, I do have some some uh, uh, publications here a couple of the dinosaur ridge and and a couple of more general publications and more of those more of those tracks if you're interested i'll give uh i'll be um give the younger generation a gift would you like a track 
We can take this. Yeah, it's a gift. It's a gift. That's right. You know, adults have to pay through the, you know, the big bucks. <laughs> yeah. I hope this is the right place to ask this question. Somewhere down in Texas, there's supposed to be dinosaur prints next to human prints. Uh, I happen to work with. Huh? Those were chiseled. Yeah, what is? It was well, a, some were chiseled and some um, were not chiseled, not artifacts, but just misinterpreted. So it's actually very interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a whole history on this. And uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Roland Bird. Uh, I don't know if that was a, was a coincidence. He ended up stand, studying the ancestors of birds but uh, through their tracks. But he worked for the American Museum. And one of the paleontologists, he was kind of like this field guy, but, you know, very... Uh, good field uh, uh, sort of reconnaissance guy. And his boss, who was a famous paleontologist at the American Museum in New York, said, I want you to go out and find the best examples of the tracks of the main groups of dinosaurs, you know, the sauropods, the stegosaurs, the, you know, T-Rex and all of that kind of stuff. And he, and he dutifully went off and went all over um, uh, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, uh, New Mexico, down to New Mexico, Arizona, New Mexico, and back to Colorado. And not only did he find, uh, but never describe, but took photographs of the tracks near Moab in, in 1944. But when he was going through, I think it was Grants, New Mexico, he stopped at a trading post and somebody had a really nice big track of a three-toed dinosaur. And he said, where did that come from? And that came from Texas. So then he went down to Texas and spent a long time there excavating a huge area and shipping the stuff back to uh, the New York, uh, uh, American Museum in New York, where they reassembled it like 10 years later. I mean, he literally took out tons and tons of rock and there's a whole book written about his work. But he also mentioned the carving of these giant, you know, like Bigfoot human footprints. But then later in the 80s, when we started working and having symposia on tracks, there was a, a, a guy who was reputedly, I met him a long time ago. I haven't seen him a long time ago, but he was reputedly a sort of born again Christian type. And he wanted to investigate these dinosaur tracks that, or these supposed human tracks that were next to dinosaur tracks. And he was very scientific and he looked at them and looked at them and he basically said they're not human tracks, they're collapsed um, dinosaur tracks that were made in very soft mud. And he published in one of the first volumes that was ever done on dinosaur tracks, um, you know, debunking the idea that these were r real human footprints. Hasn't stopped if yeah, some were, so, some some were chiseled, some were chiseled, and the and the creationists actually have built a, a bought some land and built a museum near near the entrance to Dinosaur State Park to keep perpetuating this uh, you know whatever you want to call it you know mythology, but um, it hasn't stopped other people saying you know that they found human footprints next to dinosaur footprints in other places. In fact, it's been a problem in Korea uh, recently. So we found these giant, um, the really large pterosaur hind footprints look like, look, you know, about the size and shape of human footprints. And uh, they've been, the Korean, Korean creationists have suggested that they were, um, you know, human footprints. <laughs> I don't think too many people take it, you know, take it seriously, you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me.